Paradigm City is the city of amnesia. And the big O is the anime of amnesia because no one wants to talk about it. But of course, that means it's right up my alley. A striking and stylish noir story that combines the greatest aspects of both detective stories and mecha action that never really caught on in its home country. The Big O instantly evokes memories of the Batman animated series. Just imagine if Bruce Wayne piloted a giant robot instead of being a superhero, and that's pretty much what you get. With a story penned by a staff of Sunrise contributors led by Serial Experiments lane writer Chiaki Kanaka, you would think that this show was set up for success. However, low viewership and a middling reception neutered the Big O during its original airing. While the show was planned to have 26 episodes from the start, it was cut down to 13. That might have been all we ever heard of The Big O if it hadn't been for Western audiences resonating with its noir style and cool atmosphere. And I'm sure the killer dub didn't hurt either. The other 13 episodes were co-produced with Cartoon Network and aired only seven months after the original Japanese viewing of season two. Since then, the license has changed hands due to some corporate shuffling, and I think the IP is owned by Sentai Filmworks right now. Big O has gone to spark a pretty large following and is a cult classic among Western mecha fans, with appearances in other media such as Super Robot Wars keeping it relevant for the last 20 or so years. The Big O follows Paradigm City's top negotiator, Roger Smith, who along with his butler Norman and robot maid Dorothy, tries to keep some semblance of peace in the hectic metropolis. At the same time, Roger becomes embroiled in tales of corporate espionage, hard-boiled detective work, and then I'm pretty sure he fights a sea monster ghost at one point that's powered by electricity, and also there's one episode where a guy genetically mutates a cat into a huge killing machine. Yeah, sometimes the tone of Big O can be a little bit all over the place. At the heart of the tale is the concept of memory, and what memories can mean both to an individual and also to society at large. So is Big O worth being stuck in your memory? Let's find out. The Big O takes place primarily in the city of Paradigm, a city full of gothic architecture, a swanky nightlife for the wealthy and plenty of gutters for the rest of society to fall into. While Paradigm is apparently based off of New York City, one major difference is that much of the city falls under the protective shelter of giant domes. Inside the domes, the city appears bright and new. However, outside the protection of the giant shields, the city streets are in ruins, trees never seem to bloom, and the destitute scramble to make a living. The world outside the city is lost, supposedly destroyed by some cataclysm 40 years ago. No one can remember exactly what happened though, as the residents of Paradigm City have all lost their memories at the exact same time. Those old enough to have been alive to have experienced the memory wipe are said to have taken it the hardest, with the younger generations being relatively unbothered, as humanity charges along under the guidance of the Paradigm Corporation and the military police. Our lead, Roger Smith, is a smooth-talking negotiator voiced by Steve Bloom, who's hired to solve disputes between the rather eccentric citizens of Paradigm City. It's in the midst of one of these negotiations that we first meet meet Roger as he's been hired to deliver a ransom to a criminal named Beck in exchange for the daughter of a man named Saldano. Roger rescues the young woman only to find out that she is an android named Dorothy and not the daughter of his employer at all. No worries though, Roger hits a button on a remote stored in his jacket and the briefcase full of money simply rockets through the roof of Beck's getaway car and returns safely to Roger's location. That remote also completely locks his car down with protective armor, uh, must be a bad part of town. Roger meets with a man in an establishment called Speakeasy. This contact is an information broker known only as Big Ear, and he's a source of info for Roger many times throughout the series. If Roger needs to know where to go during an investigation, Big Ear is usually his go-to. Hell, sometimes the show will literally just play a voiceover of him telling Roger information while Roger drives somewhere. 
While that can come off sounding a little slapshod, it really does fit with the noir theme, and if non-linear confusing editing isn't your thing, well, you're gonna have bigger problems with the Big O than Roger getting info off screen. The Big O really likes to tell its stories by opening an episode with Roger or the city in some form of peril, and then having a flashback until the episode meets up with the opening for the finale. While this is a pretty common narrative structure, I do sometimes feel like it makes episodes of The Big O feel a little rushed. Get used to Roger teleporting to a location to talk to a character for only a few lines, because that happens a lot. If I had to hazard a guess at why some of these episodes have such weird pacing, it's probably a combination of the way the narrative is structured and the fact that the last third of an episode is almost always reserved for a giant robot fight, so you have to get to the crux of the mystery faster than a Japanese bullet train. So in this instance, Big Ear tells Roger that his former client, Saldano, is in possession of a memory fragment. Sometimes the people of Paradigm City can recover their memories from before the event, and sometimes these memories are found on discs later in the series. Saldano having a memory fragment is interesting to Roger, but he doubts it could be a reason to kidnap the man's daughter. Even more concerning than that is the fact that Roger's old friend, Major Dan Dastin, from the military police shows up, telling Roger that the MPs are on the case and he should keep out of it. He does give Roger the piece of info that Saldano doesn't even have a daughter, so what could Beck be holding hostage? Dorothy also shows up and asks to hire Roger for his protection. When he decides to go snoop around Saldano's factory, she gets in his car saying that there's no way that he can get her out. And that's very true, because we're about to find out that Dorothy can really pack a punch. When they arrive at the factory, it looks as if something huge was being constructed, and they find Saldano dying on the floor. He reaches out to Dorothy and calls her Nightingale, but before Roger can ask about that, they're interrupted by Beck's goons who try to blow them up with a rocket launcher. Dorothy and Roger make a pretty good team as they take care of the gangsters, but right after Norman calls Roger and tells him that Beck is attacking the city with a giant robot. We realize this robot must be Dorothy's big sister and is aptly named Dorothy One. The military police try to stop it as it is attempting to steal the minting plates from the reserve downtown. Luckily for the MPs who are pretty much useless against such a giant threat, the Big O arrives with superhero theme song and all. Big O is as tall as most of the city's buildings and its design really reminds me of like giant robo. Big O punches a hole in Dorothy 1, and we see that Dorothy has been drawn to the site of the battle and is interfacing with the giant robot. Maybe she's trying to tell her big sister to stop being bad. The huge robot crashes down right on top of her as Dastin dives in to knock her out of the way and the episode comes to a close. Quite a strong opening to the series in my opinion, and it really shows off the show's strong art style and use of dark colors along with both on foot and giant robot action. When the dust settles, Dostin is shocked to find no trace of Dorothy and orders his men to stop the Big O from fleeing. However, Roger hides the Big O in the city's subway system, a place where even the military police fear to tread. Paradigm City seems to survive by blindly facing towards the future, and for many people, the ruins of the old underground hold too many memories, and perhaps too many truths, to bear. Later on, Roger sees Dorothy at night in the city with a man that he surmises to be her true father. Roger bursts in to confront them about everything going on, but before he can, Beck's goons knock him out with a stun gun and shoot Dorothy's father, killing him. Dostin tells Roger that Timothy Wainwright had recovered memories of when he was a scientist and he used his knowledge of building Megaduces to create blueprints for Saldano though we don't know why he would want to sell blueprints of a giant death machine to someone. Dostin runs off when he hears that the robot is rampaging around town again, but this time Beck is controlling it remotely from his VW van. Roger calls on Big O, but can't just punch his way through this one, as Dorothy's been strapped into the giant robot's head to be used as a power regulator. Roger uses a grappling hook hidden in his watch to get up to Dorothy and unhook her from the control center, telling her to be who she's supposed to be, Dorothy Wainwright. 
Dorothy spends much of the series in a constant search for self-expression and acceptance, and I think it's interesting that it kicks off here with this line from Roger. Beck is then arrested and Dorothy decides to work for Roger as his maid in order to pay him back for saving her life, and because her father is dead, so she's pretty much got nowhere to go. Finally, we learn that Wainwright sold the blueprints to the Megaduce in order to pay for the material to create Dorothy, an attempt at resurrecting his daughter that died 40 years earlier. So now we have the setup for the rest of the series. The Big O was originally planned for a multi-season run, but due to low viewership, only 13 episodes were initially made. It wasn't until two years later, in collaboration with Cartoon Network, that episodes 14 through 26 would be animated and aired. This has an effect on the flow of the story that I'm not totally sure was intentional. Most of the first season's episodes consist of episodic stories that focus on general world building, along with mystery building as well. What, did you think the person who wrote Serial Experiments Lane was going to let a show have a straightforward ending? While most of the stories are wrapped up within 24 minutes, it's the enduring characters and themes that make the Big O so enticing, even when the overall narrative is thin at best. First, and perhaps most importantly, is Angel, the femme fatale foil to Roger that always seems to pop up when it's most convenient. Angel first shows up in episode 3 under the name Casey Jenkins, wanting Roger to take a job for the Paradigm Corporation that involves getting the nearby electric dam back online. Casey reveals herself to be less of a pencil pusher and more of a super spy when she secretly tags along on the job, powering on the turbines of the dam and using Roger as a cover. She meets back up with him and reveals her true-ish nature, telling him to call her Angel. While Angel oozes confidence in her own abilities, she's taken aback when turning on the turbines causes a giant electric eel to start attacking. Roger puts the monster down with the big O and some help from a local shutting off the dam. Angel takes off leaving the negotiator with more questions than answers and a feeling that Angel might not truly work for the Paradigm Corporation at all. Angel is a pretty great character in that you never really know what she's up to. One moment she could be helping Roger and the next she could be holding him at gunpoint. And also the few times that her and Dorothy interact, she does not really like her. I think that Angel gets even more interesting once the second season rolls around and we see that she appears to be sometimes in way over her head and she loses that sense of control that she seems to value. Now if Roger has a Catwoman comparison in Angel, then it would make sense that he would also have a Joker. While Beck does come back as an antagonist multiple times, he's not nearly threatening enough to be elevated that highly, he's more like a calendar man, or that guy that squirts ketchup in people's eyes. Now, if there were a good comparison for the Joker in the Big O, it would have to be the bandaged and truth-obsessed Schwarzwald. Roger's most in-your-face villain is introduced as a reporter for the Paradigm Press, named Michael Sabok. As a reporter, Zabok became obsessed with bringing truth about the history of Paradigm City to the people. In fact, he was so obsessive that he disappeared one day, resulting in Roger being hired to hunt him down to retrieve a manuscript that he was working on. After discovering that Sabok had an apartment rented away from family, Roger is almost blown up as the crazed Schwarzwald reveals himself and basically just tells Roger to fuck off. Every time Schwarzwald shows up in the series, it seems to prompt Roger to look inside himself, or in his own words, face his own inner darkness. As the show goes on, Roger begins to question things around him that he has taken at face value and his interactions with the bandaged terrorist is often a catalyst for these introspective moments. In the episode where Schwarzwald is introduced, Roger gets inspired to delve into the ruins underneath the city. Of course, he keeps Big O in these subway tunnels, but below that are mysterious pristine corridors that appear to be recently constructed. For the first time in the series, we see Roger in shock as he falls off a ladder and hallucinates that he's in a forest, until Dorothy comes by and wakes him up. Delving deeper, the duo find a huge room containing a scale model of the city and a huge dormant megaduce known as the Archetype. 
Schwartzwald starts lighting everything on fire until Dorothy somehow communicates with the giant robot and wakes it up. It rampages around the room, apparently killing Schwartzwald in its fury. Roger is forced to call the Big O to take the archetype down, and Dorothy is left to wonder if she is somehow related to the Megaduces. Of course, that isn't the last time that the bandaged villain shows up, as he reappears in Season 1's penultimate episode, which is uh, blatantly titled, uh, Enemy is Another Big. In this episode, the head of Paradigm, Alex Rosewater, gives Roger a job directly. He wants Roger to track down Michael Sabok and give him a severance check. Rosewater won't listen to Roger's explanation that Sabok is dead. Well, it turns out that Schwarzwald is a slippery son of a bitch because not only is he supposedly alive, but he confronts Roger in a giant robot called the Big Duo. Big Duo is strangely similar to the Big O in design, except it has big wing arms and it can fly. Schwarzwald reveals to Roger that he plans to bomb the city's domes with Big Duo. All while dressed as a jester at a party for a bunch of rich socialites, he then ignites all the masks that the partygoers are wearing, causing some of them to jump out of the windows of the tall building. See, very Joker-esque. Up to this point, the show has been sprinkling in little pieces of info that suggest that perhaps the Megaduces have minds of their own, or at the very least, house their own memories. This is illustrated well when Roger finally defeats Big Duo by hanging Big O off of the dome in order to literally get the drop on it. The huge robot walks away of its own volition until it powers down and dies, prompting Schwarzwald to ask if the Megaduce truly need masters at all. Personally, I think that the Big O is most entertaining when it delves into its own world building head first. While the mystery of the lost memories is also an interesting part of the story, I do find that moments that focus on it tend to be the hardest parts of Big O to follow. Luckily, that stuff doesn't start being really prevalent until the show's second season, though the first does offer some answerless questions that left me scratching my head. Much of the rest of the first season are standalone episodes that deal with Roger taking on negotiation contracts. Usually this serves to deliver some lore about the city or to explore its current day setting more thoroughly. While I'm not gonna talk about every single episode because that would just take too long, there are a couple of standalones that I do wanna mention before we move on to season two and the ultimate conclusion of the Big O. One that I really do love is episode eight, Missing Cat, in which Dorothy finds and takes in a seemingly stray cat that she names Pero. Roger isn't a fan of the new feline friend and wants it gone, but Norman suggests keeping it. Dorothy connects with Pero on a level that Roger doesn't really understand, but guesses that the cat may have awoken memories of the girl that Dorothy was modeled after. The cat's owners come calling on Roger and ask for the cat back. Roger wants to let Dorothy keep it at this point, but the couple say that the cat is their son and they need him. Their conversation is interrupted when an insane scientist named Eugene rolls up in a helicopter and opens fire on them kidnapping Pero and Dorothy and killing the couple in the process. Big Ear tells Roger that Eugene recovered memories of being a geneticist and has gone batshit insane and when Roger tracks him down, we find that he's been transforming people into dog monsters in this big lab and he's even got armed guards and everything. Dorothy reveals to Roger that one of the giant monsters is Pero, who ends up killing Eugene of his own will. We then find out that the couple had hired Eugene to use genetic material from their dead son to create a cat, which is quite a twist. Finally, Dorothy asks Pero to come back with them, but he understands there's no way to have a life as a giant mutant, so he walks into the flames. Another great episode from the first season is number 10, Winter Night Phantom. While the adventure that the cast goes on throughout it is fairly self-contained, it introduces a lot of stuff that will persist throughout Big O's mystery until its finale, so I hesitate to call it a true standalone episode. A mad bomber has been targeting retired city officials throughout Paradigm, and their last bombing killed 46 people. While Dostin and the military police are trying to catch the perpetrator, Dostin himself is afflicted with troubling dreams. 
His mind keeps replaying this scene over and over. A man shoots a woman who's holding a red balloon, and this imagery leaks over into his daily life. Dostin asks Roger for help, telling him that the scene is from an old movie that he saw as a child. Roger finds out that it was called Winter Night Phantom, however, all copies of it were destroyed. Apparently, the woman in the film was an actress named Sybil Rowan, and she was anti-paradigm, so the company destroyed all known prints. When the city is attacked by a giant robot later on, Dostin chases down the bomber who is driving a balloon truck. Dostin chases the bomber to a dock, drawing his gun on them. They reveal that they are a woman and call themselves Sybil. Dostin shoots her to stop her from hitting a detonator, and we realize that he's just played out the scene from his memories. In one final moment, we see that, in the past, Dostin was watching the movie with his younger sister. A younger sister who looks exactly like Sybil Rowan. So yeah, this episode has a lot of twists and turns. It's incredibly dark and moody, and the symbolism of the red balloon drifting alone into the night sky is something that will stay with the Big O until its finale. The mysteries of the Big O's world continue to build into a crescendo in the season 1 finale. In this episode, Roger faces off against a mysterious killer that wears a red coat. The killer appears to be targeting people that have recovered memories from 40 years ago. Well, this isn't too shocking in the world of the Big O, but these victims were in their 20s, far too young to have these memories naturally. The victims also all apparently claim to have been born outside the city, something that we believe is impossible at the end of season one. All the questions about memory have worn on Roger throughout the season, so by episode 13 he actually starts asking questions about it. This is a pretty huge change in Roger. He goes from a person who believes that ignoring the past is the only way to move forward, to someone who is desperately trying to find the truth. In many ways, his journey reflects that of Sabok. As he gets closer to the truth, things in the show begin to take a psychological turn, and perhaps it's just sheer luck that Roger doesn't turn into another Schwarzwald, pushed over the edge of insanity by his relentless search for Paradigm's truths. Roger has a conversation with Norman, wondering if the other ever questions his ability to maintain the Big O, or if he ever wonders why he acts as Roger's butler. The episode then takes a pretty confusing turn as Roger explores the old tunnels under the city, but he keeps flashing between that and being in an old abandoned library facing a red coat adorned angel. Angel tells him the powers that be do not approve of the way he's using the Megaduce. Roger is almost as disoriented as I felt watching this, and he finds a single book called Metropolis that contains a list of all the victims' names, along with barcodes next to them. Roger goes to meet the author, a man named Gordon Rosewater, who was the former head of Paradigm and the man who's credited with building the domes. He's also the father of the current Paradigm leader, Alex Rosewater, but we'll have a lot more to do with him in Season 2. Roger goes to meet Gordon and accuses him of planting memories in the minds of children many years ago. That's why the victims are recovering memories that aren't theirs. Gordon will only say that the book Roger holds is all a lie. It details the fall of humanity and a huge war that swept the globe, but is mysteriously unfinished. Roger asks why he never finished the book, and Gordon simply says that you gotta reap when the crop is ripe, and gives Roger a nice tomato for his trouble. Now that tomato is a bastard, let me tell you. For all the symbolism in Big O, it's the weird cryptic bullshit that does sort of get on my nerves and by episode 13 and 14, it was really coming to a head. I guess it doesn't help that the middle of Big O presents the most questions while giving you precisely zero answers, and I cannot even imagine how annoying it must have been to be a fan during that two year time period where there was no more new content. Roger decides he's got to find his own answers and goes back down into the tunnels. He's confronted by the red coat, but instead of being Angel like the viewer might suspect, this time the killer is none other than Dorothy. Roger is shot in the arm and almost killed when the Big O bursts through the floor, revealing that Dorothy is in the cockpit, and the red coat happens to be an android that looks uh, exactly the same as her. 
With the help of Dorothy, Roger is able to pilot the Big O just in time to see three Megaduces rise from the ocean. He braces himself for the inevitable battle, telling Dorothy that sometimes you just want to stand in the rain without an umbrella. That's what it means to live free. I've seen a lot of ways to interpret that line on the internet, but to me it seems as though in that moment Roger realizes that despite his questions and anxieties about who he is, he's choosing to face this problem head on, fully exposing himself to the danger that lies before him. For what it is, I really enjoy the first season of The Big O. Yes, it has a cliffhanger ending with way too many unanswered questions, but most of the season is standalone episodes anyway, so the highs outnumber the lows. The second season aired two years after the first and was created in collaboration with Cartoon Network, like I've said. Personally, I think season two gets off on a really bad foot as the first episode, titled Roger the Wanderer, is essentially one giant monologue partnered with a lot of vague imagery. Yes, by the time that I got to the end of the Big O, I understood why they did this and what they were going for, but I honestly did not enjoy the opener of season two being just a lot more vague questions. Roger fights the three invading Megaduces, but as he fights, he keeps dueling with falling into his own memories. Suddenly, the cockpit is filled with tomatoes, and Roger wakes up in what appears to be contemporary New York. He goes home and finds that the city isn't all destroyed, and the bank that he turned into a mansion is still a functioning business. To add insult to injury, Beck is the bank manager and kicks him out for being a seemingly crazy vagrant. We're then treated to a pretty long monologue between Roger and Norman upon a stage, which is a motif that is constantly used throughout the Big O, especially in the second season. Roger wonders what role he, as an actor in this play, is performing. Who is Roger Smith? Who was Roger Smith? And can he continue to be Roger Smith? Finally, he realizes that what is holding him back is the fear inside him. Perhaps that was the thing that was keeping him from seeking out his own memories. Roger awakens once again and kills the foreign Megaduces, and Alex Rosewater dispatches the MPs to retrieve something from them, something that he calls a special delivery. The Big O is repaired while Roger gets a contract from an old man named Roscoe, whose wife fears that he'll be assassinated just like the victims with recovered memories from season one. Roscoe says that the recovered memories were actually those of older senators. During Roger's investigation, they discover a data disk that says all of the people who recovered memories are dead except for one, and it's Roscoe. A Megaduce tries to assassinate Roscoe, but Roger puts it down with Big O, and as a thanks, Roscoe gives Roger a disc containing his memories because, surprise, Roscoe is actually an android. But double surprise, he gets his android dome blown off by a masked man named Alan Gabriel, who is Rosewater's new lackey. Throughout the first few standalone episodes in season two, we see that Rosewater really doesn't care about what happens outside of the domes and that eventually extends to him not caring about the domes either. Like, he almost lets most of the city get destroyed by a falling satellite at one point. It's made obvious that Rosewater has some sort of grand plan for the city throughout the latter 13 episodes, and once you hit episode 20, the show pretty much becomes a serialized story that moves along at a really brisk pace. As season two begins to head towards its climax, Roger has dreams, or perhaps memories, of the war that destroyed Paradigm City, along with a group of mysterious bald children. These visions are often accompanied by a barcode in Roger's eye, suggesting something quite sinister. Roger believes that Gordon Rosewater still has his memories and has just been lying the whole time, and he passes Alex and Gabriel while entering. Gordon goes on about his tomato harvest while Roger gets more frustrated, desperately asking him why he can pilot Big O and saying he wants to know what his memories are. Gordon, who I half suspect is kind of senile, has a moment of clarity and tells Roger that the Big O chose him and that the two have a contract. This causes Roger to have another barcode vision and then leave. 
The negotiator meets Angel at a bar for a drink, and they discuss the fact that Rosewater has been contacting people outside of Paradigm City. At the beginning of Big O, we were led to believe that there was no one living outside the city, at least not in any great number, but now we learn of a collective that exists outside of Paradigm called The Union. Angel is an agent for the Union, but because of her inability to perform whatever her mission was, more agents show up to complete their plans. Angel meets with them in a ruined building that I believe is supposed to be Grand Central Station. The most important appears to be a woman referred to as Vera with the designation of Agent 12. Gabriel's also there and it's revealed in this episode that he's a cyborg with a cool metal hand. Dorothy overhears their entire conversation after following Angel, and Gabriel shoots and wounds her. While all this has been going on, Roger has been fighting a huge two-headed Megaduce that was scrapped together from the parts left over from the foreign Megaduces. Rosewater is just really having a good time watching the destruction, and finally reveals that the delivery that he received from the Union back in the season opener was pieces of another Megaduce named Big Fow. Big Fow apparently cannot function to its fullest potential without something called a core memory, and Rosewater is getting pretty impatient. While the Union were the ones who scavenged the wastes outside of Paradigm for the pieces of the giant robot and delivered it to Rosewater, he apparently has decided to go back on whatever deal they made because now Vera is determined to do something that will send a message to the leader of the city. Roger tries to finish off the two-headed robot, but the Big O is starting to refuse his instructions. He sees the barcode on Big O's screen and Roger freaks out, realizing that he's one of the tomatoes. While the tomato symbolism gets a little overbearing in these episodes, the explanation for it is pretty interesting. Roger always sees barcodes and bald children. The victims with implanted memories also had barcodes next to their names in the Metropolis book. It all leads us to realize that tomatoes are just a metaphor for Gordon Rosewater's true project. The old man has been trying to create perfect artificial humans for many years. He said earlier that tomatoes could be specifically bred to resemble its original form i.e. humans have engineered fruits and veggies to our specifications, but if we selectively breed them a certain way, we could get them back to how they were originally. That is what Gordon supposedly wanted to do with humans. Personally, I think he wanted to create perfect copies of people before they were memory wiped, but everything to do with this does end up just being theory. Big O shows Roger that Dorothy is in trouble in his cockpit screen, and Roger abandons the fight to go and help her. Dostin and Roger show up, but Gabriel escapes through the roof, and Dostin finally admits to Roger that the MPs don't have the force necessary to defend the city. Vera is then seen enjoying her revenge on the city, as the two-headed bot causes destruction. That is, until Rosewater activates the Big Fow, even without the core memory, and it easily destroys Vera's mech. However, right after this, the Big Fow goes berserk and ignores Rosewater's commands. I gotta say, up until now, Alex Rosewater has been played pretty straight as the ominous brooding villain who's always one step ahead of everyone, but the second that his plans start going awry, he turns into a sniveling whiny bitch boy who's literally like, no, my plan. It's, it's actually pretty funny. Luckily, Roger and the Big O are there to clean up Rosewater's mess, and the Big Fowl powers down with him inside. But just because he can't use his giant death robot doesn't mean Rosewater is done with the city. He resumes his place of power and has all of the Union spies rounded up. Gabriel sticks to his side despite almost killing him at one point. It really seems like the cyborg does things according to his own whims, like confronting and then ultimately shooting Vera because he doesn't feel like going along with their plan. Rosewater seems to know that Gabriel is in contact with Union and works for them. In fact, Rosewater refers to Gabriel as his ambassador to the Union, so uh, apparently neither of them really care. Surprisingly, Beck is let out of prison by Gabriel. Beck's recovered memories let him pilot a Megaduce, along with figuring out that he can actually hook androids up as a like power supply or memory for them. And that's a very important skill for someone like Rosewater. The two come up with a scheme to make the Big Fowl fully operational, leading Beck to take a force of battle robots to siege Roger's mansion. 
Of course, at the time, Roger is exploring the tunnels under the city where he meets a wounded Vera. She fires a bunch of flares that are apparently the signal for the Union to begin bombing Paradigm. Norman does an admirable job defending the house with heavy weaponry, and I love whenever they give him something to do outside of fixing up Big O. Unfortunately, by the time Roger returns, the bots have busted in and stolen Dorothy away. Roger chases after Dorothy and the Big O, but is intercepted by a repaired Big Duo, piloted by an increasingly insane Alan Gabriel. The big duo seems to be absorbing Gabriel into the cockpit, and it isn't long before the Megadus judges the cyborg as guilty. Schwartzwald shows up one last time to basically just call Gabriel a dumb bitch, and then the cockpit eats him with a bunch of wires. Roger finally catches up to Dorothy standing on the roof of a building, but we see that she is unresponsive and her memory core has been removed, leaving her as an empty husk. Roger leaves her body in the mansion after Norman tells him that even if they retrieved the memory core, the only person who could repair her would be the late Dr. Wainwright. The Union begins their bombing run of the city as we see their fleet of planes fly overhead. Rosewater has now taken care of his daddy issues in the ultimate way, murder. He went to the farm to ask Gordon not to take his memories to the grave and to share everything with him, but the old man either refused or is just senile, so Rosewater burns down the farm and uses his influence to keep fire brigades and emergency crews away from the dome. Now he begins the final leg of his plan and launches in the Big Fow, which is now equipped with Dorothy's memory core. Rosewater doesn't care if the bombs destroy the entire city because he wants to level it and recreate it to his perfect specifications anyway. While the war on the surface is going on, Angel has been underground and comes across a TV set complete with cameras and everything. Angel is shocked because this set is exactly the same as her childhood home. Vera enters and also Gordon isn't dead and he's there. Vera starts whipping Angel until we see her bare back and the scars on it, and Gordon perks up at this because these scars reveal something about Angel's true nature. Roger interrupts Angel's punishment with some slick moves with his grappling hook, and Gordon finally speaks up saying that Roger and Angel are actually not tomatoes, and that he at one time hired the original Roger Smith to conduct negotiations with someone he calls the director of this world. Gordon admits that he was shown the book Metropolis in a dream and merely wrote it down. Vera says that ultimately she's won because the Union is bombing the city, but Gordon replies, uh, no they're not. He tells her that the Union doesn't exist, and the people outside the city are nothing more than a scattering of survivors. Everything about Paradigm is a lie, an illusion, and an act. We see this illustrated as Rosewater flies into the sky above the city and collides with a giant stage light on a huge metal lattice. The bombers we thought were flying over Paradigm were nothing more than massive lighting apparatuses. Finally, Roger enters a repaired Big O to go out and fight Alex Rosewater, while Gordon beckons Angel to come with him so she can fulfill her destiny. Roger battles Big Fow, but nothing he does has any effect, and eventually he's knocked around so badly that he loses consciousness and is thrown into the ocean. We see Big Fow is beginning to absorb Rosewater just like Big Duo did with Gabriel, but he demands that it cease as he is its true Dominus, which it, it doesn't seem to care or believe him. Big O begins to do the same to Roger, but he asks the giant robot if that's really what it wants, and the wires retract. Roger and the Big O have gone from an unthinking machine and its pilot to partners over the second season. Beck enters Roger's mansion, feeling kind of bad about the outcome of the last battle. You get the feeling that he wants to defeat Roger, but not in such a cheap way. He would probably like it to be way funnier for a start. He approaches Dorothy and suddenly she wakes up, going to dive down into the ocean and retrieve Roger so they can finish the fight. Dorothy is able to hook the Big O's wires into her own head, allowing Roger to access Big O final stage and blast the Big Fow with a huge awesome looking laser that blows up the entire dome. Underground, Gordon takes Angel deeper and deeper in an elevator until they reach a room that looks like the holodeck from Star Trek. Gordon says peace out and disappears, knowing that the bird whose wings were cut shall return to its original form. 
Angel sprouts some wings and disappears, and we see in the battle above the ground that the sky and eventually the whole world fade away. Finally, Angel appears in her true form as Big Venus, the final Megadeuce and the reason that Paradigm City reset 40 years ago. This time, however, we see that Angel is simultaneously in the director's room, back in her original office attire, formal getup, and looking like she's back in control. Visions of Roger and Dorothy comfort her as she gives Big Venus the final command, and it merges with the Big O, and the world resets back to the beginning of Episode 1, as Roger the Negotiator drives through Paradigm City, passing by a bewildered Angel and Dorothy on the city street. So yeah, the ending of Big O has been debated online hotly since its release, with some groups of people subscribing to a theory saying that Paradigm City was like the Truman Show, broadcasting its happenings to the world as some sort of experiment. Personally, I think the ending is pretty simple and that it's all just a big simulation. It's the stuff with Angel and Big Venus doing the reset that really walked that down for me. While yes, there are stage lights above the city, it all just goes in hand with the play metaphor that Big O has been running with the entire time. Roger has referred to himself as an actor playing the part of Roger Smith many times, and Paradigm itself has been called a grand play over the course of the show as well. So much of what happens in the Big O boils down to simulation metaphor that I think that it will only make full sense on a second watch, but hey, it does explain why Angel is always popping up wherever she needs to be, or why Big Ear always has the exact information Roger needs to advance a case. Honestly, I do find this type of ending to be pretty disappointing, while it works with something like Serial Experiments Lane, which had an internet and digital communication as a constant theme. Big O just seems like it didn't know what to do, so it said, I, everything is a simulation, I guess, fuck it, and went with it. I think I find it frustrating because the world of Big O that is actually set up is really interesting. Everything to do with the Union and artificial humans with implanted memories and the mystery of why there are these giant robots in underground ruins is much more interesting than the actual ending. It also leads to a lot of the mysteries of the show just not being resolved in a similar way to some J.J. Abrams mystery box BS like Lost. We get full episodes focusing on androids existing within Paradigm City, with ominous revelations from Roger about how they may have existed in Paradigm City long before humans ever got there. And the reason for that is because the simulation thought it would be mysterious, I guess. Just like Lost, the questions asked are way too compelling for the resolution offered up, and I, that just might be the worst thing about the Big O. So those were my thoughts on the Big O, one of the coolest giant robot shows from the 90s that succeeds more on its ideas than its conclusions. While I did rag on the ending there for a bit, I do still think that The Big O is worth watching. At least half this show is episodic stories that are enjoyable in a vacuum, and even when the overarching narrative gets going, it is compelling. It just fumbles right at the end, in my opinion. So, thank you for watching, and I will see you again soon. Hello everyone, welcome to today's end card. I'm going to start it off real quick by apologizing for the fact that you could probably hear a fucking snowplow out my window right now, so there's not much I can do about that. But, uh, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Let's thank our wonderful channel, uh, members. A.K.A. Batosai, Argan, Griever, Ashar, Kazar, Brian, Sanchez, D. Mels, Daniel, Johnson, Detter, V, Dilla, Soul, 22, Gert, Joe Castellanos, Joe Cavazos, John Lamb, Johnny G, Canto 20, McLean, Nugent, Mr. Smash, Zappa, Slave, Video Gamer, 75, Trey Hardy, and Sindustries. Wow, I got through that one pretty easy. I think I actually need to edit this. Uh... I think everyone who is a member is on this list, but I think there are some old members on here too, which is fine. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Anyway, um, Big O was really interesting, and I hope that you guys liked the video. Coming up next is actually going to be a video on a 1988 OVA for Starship Troopers. Super interesting and weird. I didn't even know it exists, so keep a lookout for that. That video probably will actually, like, I know I always say it'll be out next week and then a month goes by, but 
Like, I'm already basically done with the script, so it might actually be out next week. Um... <laughs> If you want to check out anything else I have been doing, you can go ahead uh, on the description in, in this video's description and on the main channel page. There is a link to my gaming channel where we have been playing through Dragon Ball Z Budokai in preparation for making a video about Budokai. And also, I think, uh, uh, yeah, Kingdom Hearts has gone up at this point. So right now I'm playing through Kingdom Hearts and we're about to start something new because I, I basically have finished Budokai. So. If you want to, go ahead and check that out. Uh, we're about to hit 400 subs on the gaming channel, so that's fun. It's just a thing I do in my off time. But anyway, anyone who has gone over there and checked it out, thank you very much. Anyone who has liked and subscribed here, you are amazing, and I, I appreciate you every day. And uh, we will see you very, very soon.